Hello, friends. It's Eric Ting, Artistic Director of California Shakespeare Theater. Uh, welcome to our panel today. It's a special spunk Zoom reunion panel. Um, it's actually part of uh, a new initiative here at Cal Shakes that we're calling the Cal Shakes Chronicle. And um, it's an effort on our part to reflect back with accountability and candor on the successes and challenges of Cal Shakes anti-racism journey. Um, and this esteemed panel is going to be the inaugural program. So we're really, really excited to have everyone here. And I wanna thank you all for tuning in. This is Direct Address Chronicle. Hey, Eric. Hey, Mose, how are you? <laughs> how you doing? Yay! <laughs> Hi, Eric. Hey, Margo. Hey, what's up? Oh, not much, not much, not much. I was enjoying all those photographs from um, from the, I guess, the show launch. Yeah. The blind spotting. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. So important, so important, so important. <laughs> so exciting. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I was in LA, day, day, but I was only there for a day. So. Oh, hi, Paloma. Hi, Paloma. Hello. Paloma. Hey. Hello. Yes, Patricia. Hi. Hello. Hi. Oh, my God. I've been scrolling and looking at y'all's faces. I'm so happy to see your faces. Hey. How you doing? Hey. Good. Oh, look, I, I've changed my name from iPhone to myself. Y'all you know? <laughs> would think we hadn't spent a year on Zoom and things, you know, my like, like technology. Hey, Patricia. Hey, Eric. How are you? Yeah, I'm well. How are you? I'm great. Great to see you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having. Hey, thanks for stopping in. Well, Mose, are you? Are you? Is that a virtual background or a real background behind you? <laughs> it's a real one. Where yeah. are you? <laughs> in my room in LA. I uh, love it. <laughs> so she's a teacher. Uh, she's a teacher. I do online teaching and like the like parents demand that yes. it looks like a classroom. I <laughs> so. was like that look it 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 hit the mark. Uh, so I teach um English to kids from Israel and China. On the wow. <laughs> and had that been happening before the pandemic? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's how I knew That's how to use awesome. Zoom. I was like, oh, I got this. I got this. You've been I using knew. Zoom all along. <laughs> Hold on one second. <laughs> oh, y'all don't have to hold on because I said hold oh, on. I oh, I thought what's I, happening. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm basically saying... <laughs> <laughs> I was not saying I'm going away for a second. Jonathan. Jonathan. Hello. Hello. Oh my lord. Look at this. Oh <laughs> my god. Amose. Paloma. I miss you. Hersha, I can't see you, but I, I feel you and I see two two I'm pictures back. of Eric. <laughs> Hi Patricia. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi, Margo. Hi, Jonathan. Um, we're going to just do some introductions. Is that okay? Uh, I'm Eric Ting, he, him, his pronouns. I'm the artistic director, current artistic director of California Shakespeare Theater. Um, and I'm actually zooming in uh, finally uh, from um, unceded Chichenyo speaking Ohlone lands here mm. in the Bay Area um, to offer a little visual um, description of what, what folks are seeing on the screen right now. I am a Chinese American man with um, slightly vintage glasses, close cropped hair, a black button up shirt. And I am sitting in front of, in my hotel room actually, which is largely white walls with a bed with a mustard yellow headboard. Hi, my name is Mose Ade Henry. I go by she, her, hers. And I played uh, the glorious Missy May as well as a host of incredible characters. And uh, I'm in Woodland Hills, Los Angeles. It's kind of like a district in Los Angeles, but yeah. Um, what else should I say? What else should I? This is my wonderful backdrop that I got from Amazon. So I teach uh, children from China and Israel, and I have this 
beautiful backdrop to give that classroom <laughs> feel. You'll see the globe, the board, these little flags of the uh, alphabet. And I have uh, braids and a black top. And uh, yeah, that's it. Hey, I'm Margot Hall, she, her. I am coming to you from Ohlone land in Oakland, California. And uh, I am an African-American woman, uh, lighter skinned. I have braids and I am sitting in my office and behind me or on the side of me is a photo of me that was taken in a show at Intersection for the Arts. And so I have this picture of just my face and it's like looking down on me to make sure I do the right thing. And I have on a flowery blue shirt uh, with white flowers and I am super excited to be here. Hi, my name is Patricia McGregor. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am um, coming from Kumea land in San Diego. I am currently um, wearing, I'm a caramel color brown skin woman with red, a red pop of lipstick and a red heart shirt um, in a room with um, a white wall uh, with a, a red heart on the back wall and sitting most importantly next to um, my sister, Paloma McGregor and I was the director of Spunk. And I'm gonna popcorn into my sister. <laughs> Zip! Zap! Zap! <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, I'm Paloma McGregor. Uh, I use she and her pronouns. I am also here in uh, the unceded territories of the Kumea. 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 I'm visiting. I got here a couple days ago. Um, stolen lands now called San Diego. I am... Uh, uh, the color of the sand in St. Croix, <laughs> our homeland, um, which is also known as Ai Ai by the indigenous Carib, Arawak and Taino. I am in the same room as Patricia and I'll call attention to the light streaming through um, the slats in uh, the blinds and a part of a red and white tapestry that if you were here, you might know that it says you are welcome here. Oh. My name is John Moscone. Uh, my preferred pronouns are uh, he, him, his. Um, I am, uh, <clears throat> I'm an in Ramatush uh, land, um, now known as San Francisco. I am actually at a friend's house. So um, I am a white man, uh, 56 years old with a, a white beard, black glasses, a yellow uh, wrist band around a black Apple watch, uh, pale skin, a little bit of color because I was just in Mexico. Um, I am balding. Uh, I am not bald yet, uh, but I have brownish gray hair and I have a light blue, um, polo shirt on and behind me are two paintings at my friend's house. Uh, one is yellow and has Starsky and Hutch the movie. Um, I, I, I can't go into it. And then uh, another one, which is a black and white uh, painting over here. And I'm sorry that there's noise, but I'm downstairs at a political event. Um, but I am more happy to be with you all than at that. So okay. thank you for having me. So we're really just hoping that we'll just have a nice relaxed conversation um, for the next 50, 50 minutes, 50 minutes or so. Um, just reflecting back on this production of Spunk, uh, which, you know, when I arrived here at Cal Shakes, um, it's something of an apocryphal production, right? Because of all the things that it represented for this organization. Um, and rather than me try and fill that information and I'm hoping you all will. So I'm gonna just kick, kick us off with a question if that's all right, which is, um, yeah, how did how did Spunk happen? Well, it, John could start if he wants to because it did start with a phone call from John to me. And I think he had maybe seen Hurt Village, maybe? Or just knew, I, yeah, I think he had seen Hurt Village and he said he wanted to work. And I felt like one of the, it's related to your question, I think one of the beautiful things is 
he started with foregrounding, here's this piece of work that we think is incredible. And also we've never done this before. He said, it's, I, I am, I'm kind of shocked and surprised, or at least this is my memory, but he said, I, I'm coming with shock and surprise and humbly to say, we've never had a black author on our stage before. And we think Zora Neale Hurston is the perfect American canonical classic author. And this piece is, you know, the perfect introduction to that. And he was also really honest about like, this is new for us. And so how do we build this all together? And I thought it was such a wonderful offering because it was offering like, space and resources and also not pretending that this was like where they already were. And, and it was also such a really generous like invitation to what was the beginning of like a real invitation to be a home and to start something new. And so that was at least my beginning experience. But maybe John, if you want to start with like before that, what made you choose to, to start a new journey? Um, and, and then we can kind of riff on that. Cause it really was, it was, it's still one of my, it's like all of your plays are your favorite babies. But if I were to say like, I really had favorite twins or triplets, like this production with these people and the space and trust, John, you, you started there and the ripple effect I see, Eric, you continuing on is like really one of the most important, um, things, rewarding, fulfilling things of my life and career. So I'm interested for you, John, how, how it started for you. And then we can talk more about how, how it kind of continued for all of us. Well, my memory isn't quite as good as it should be. I actually didn't see Hurt Village until after you agreed to direct the play. Um, all I remember was calling you. Uh, I had called... I don't know, I, I, call, I called Bill Roush and I asked about, I heard, I said, I saw your name on a workshop and he said, she's amazing. I hung up the phone, I called you and we talked for about 45 minutes. And I, if I remember correctly, we didn't really talk about the play much. We didn't talk about what you do or anything. We just talked about where we were at, that I want to invite you. And after 45 minutes, I said, would you do it? And you said, yeah. And then um, that's how we started uh, was just with that kind of uh, hand. Oh my gosh. Hi, Tai. Tai. Hey. Lemon. Lemon snuck oh. in. Slemon sneaking in. <laughs> that's how, I, that's how Slemon do it. That's how we do it. Uh, so good. Um, I, 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 I do remember uh, being very uh, mindful of the fact that um, I was stunned and shocked and, and culpable in, in the uh, uh, absence um, of uh, black authors uh, on stage at the organization. And I had um, worked on Spunk, assisted uh, Joe Papp during the time when I worked there when Spunk premiered um, uh, after Colored Museum. And I, uh, I, I loved the piece. And I, um, I just love storytelling. It's, it was just, it's a, it's an ode to storytelling. And, um, and I, I don't know, I'm looking about to cry when I say this. I'm just <laughs> like, I, I just wanted to do it. And I thought, what's stopping me? But me. And, 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 and Patricia's generous response to my, my invitation and my kind of admittance to that made it, it set the foundation forward for the choices to be made, uh, led by her to create this company. Thank you, brother. It, I got a little weepy speaking too. <laughs> it really is like sometimes it's hard out there, but sometimes we like create something that really feels like family that holds each other and holds each other through transitions into the new. You know, we got a vision into the new. And so I felt like we all held each other in this transition or in these transitions. And hey John, I'll, I wanna... I'll say, oh. Oh, 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 go ahead. No, please go ahead, Patricia. I was going to say one of the first things, clearly, I'm here with my sister when we talk about family, like one of the things that really drew me to Spunk, we, we spent middle school and high school 
in, um, or at least I spent middle school and she spent high school in Orlando, Florida, which is near Eatonville. So we mm -hmm. grew up going to the Zora Neale Hurston Festival. So like between Zora Neale Hurston, who I grew up knowing about and like thinking about the way in which she listened to language and hearing about that, even before I was in theater, when I was like a sports kid, we used mm -hmm. to go to the festival. And then George C. Wolfe, who's kind of one of my favorite like theatricalists where he like throws a big entertaining party and then he pulls the rug out and is like, ha ha, I got you here. And now we're gonna talk about some things. So mm -hmm. when I thought about who I would want to partner with, Something John and I talked about early on was in the three sections, It all my concept for them was that they almost go from like this one dimensional world where we're back in time to like the two dimensional world where like the zoot suits, like when we're kind of in that world where we start to, and then the final scene, which to me was like the idea of a three dimensional world where we get to be more fully ourselves. And once I read that a few times, that felt like a really strong, impulse or way through it's not in the text but it was kind of a way I, I perceived it and so I was like I want my long-term most trusted collaborator and also physical articulator of of that journey and I think that became a really exciting organizing principle for us so I brought Paloma on to be she was the choreographer but really to me she was like co-creator of the whole world and then we thought oh we need a really uh, you know, actors with a great dexterity for language, both physical, vocal, stylistic. Um, and so we were luckily able to build this amazing community who really do, like we could not see each other for 10 years and, and still feel so much warmth. And I see Michael Loker um, snuck in here and we can talk with him in a moment about what it was to build that world, that world that was so lush and so beautiful and had the simple magic that embraced the language and made it feel both modern and timeless. And so it's really, it was really a dream team. So I can pass to Paloma, I can pass to these glorious actors who I continued to work with and will continue to work with. Um, but that's, you know, it, it went from John coming to, John having the idea, John coming to me, me coming to Paloma, and then us coming to the cast and the designers to be, be able to create this little magic bubble. And I took it very seriously because I said, this is the first, I take every play seriously, but when it's the first time, I thought I want to knock this out of the park to make space for more. Mm -hmm. And, and what makes me so excited that it, it did people still talk about it is I do think it helped to the success of it help to make space and appetite for more. Yeah. So I'll pass maybe to Paloma and then to the cast. You know, how did that, cause I, y'all, the cast will tell you that I, I see them trying to like back up from the wall because she got them into a physical vocabulary that was, I think a really um, unique dynamic um, thing. So I don't know if you want to talk about whatever you want to talk about. I'll just say that what was exciting for me was the yesness that was in the room. And I think that that uh, was also a yesness that John imbued uh, into the process. So, being there as a choreographer slash like, I have an idea about a puppet or, you know, there was a yesness that I think Patricia brings into every room that she shepherds. And so um, I don't, I work in concert dance typically and I work a lot in public space and I, you know, centering black voices. So this was actually for me also a threshold um, around working in regional theater. And I'll say that it kind of set a bar that I, <laughs> that I feel like I've, uh, it set a bar. There was a, there was a way in which, and I think this story, the origin story that John and Patricia tell about how this came to be, I think was imbued in the process around, we really want to invest in this being the best thing that it can be. And everybody seemed to step into the room with that as the goal, even when there may have been tensions, refocusing on that as the goal seemed to be the primary practice. And I feel like that's a practice that um, is not always present and met. And so it's one of the things that I appreciate about um, the vision for this particular work and time together and this company 
as you said, that got created, these spirits that came together to um, who I do think of as family. And one of the things I love about Paloma Saint Company, and as we relate this to Juneteenth, because I can't remember exactly if it was, I can't remember if it was Margo. I can't remember who, it might've been Margo. It was Aldo. It was Who's Aldo. That, of course it was Aldo. Of course it was Aldo. You know, hopefully part of saying yes in, in rooms is so that like the best idea can come forward. And when this idea of like, we are doing this kind of historic thing and we are doing it around the time of Juneteenth, let us gather. Let us not just make the art and let's not just make it about the community in the room, which I feel like we all felt pretty early was special, but let's extend that out and let us honor and intersect with this monumentous moment, uh, you know, at the institution with this monumental moment in the history of our country. And so I love, and you know, I, I feel like, you know, John and the company, I feel like Aldo, Mark, however it came, it was like, this is the idea. And it was like, absolutely. And then it was met with, yes, absolutely. And I, I remember it being like a potluck, like there was part the theater. Yeah, we did a potluck. Which is a potluck. Yeah. Again, I'm like, that's people bringing themselves. I'm always interested in how we can democratize and how we as an organization and individuals can see each other and celebrate and center because it also felt like centering. It wasn't just about a production to sell tickets. It was about how do we center blackness how do we center our experience and how do we all, not just the creative company here, but how do we all embrace that and centralize it? And that felt really exciting. You want to yeah. see some photos from the potluck? Sure. <laughs> Let's see. Yes. Yes, we had the best food. Ooh. Go! Everybody ate everything. Look at that pot. <laughs> empty. Empty. Empty is so good. Can somebody just describe what's happening in this photo? Aldo's talking. Aldo's no. talking. <laughs> Aldo, Aldo is professing. Yeah, well, it was really cool because he kind of explained Juneteenth because there were a lot of folks there who didn't know about Juneteenth and everyone was really excited to learn about it. And he brought this cowbell. I remember he was, we rang the cowbell and we just gathered and talked about what it represented and, um, and everybody just ate and were in communion with each other. And it was really special, really, really special. Oh, yeah. Before, I got my Before you got your perm. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm looking at everybody. Yeah, why don't we invite Michael and Tai yeah. to introduce yourselves? All right. Uh, hey, Michael, you. Oh, you want me to go first? Okay. Go first. <laughs> you should go. You were your privacy. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Tai Tillman. Uh, my pronouns uh, are he, him. I, I also answer to they, them pronouns as well. Um, I am currently. I played Slemons and Jelly in the production of Spunk. And uh, I'm currently actually in the DC metro area. Um, mm. I think I'm over on, by Van Ness UDC today, uh, but but live in Los Angeles now. Yeah, so out here doing some uh, family and friends stuff for a, for a few days. I am uh, I'm over at a friend's place and the the photos behind the paintings behind me are <laughs> are of, of her wall. <laughs> Uh, uh, as I, uh, this is not, this is not my normal domicile. So I don't, I don't know as much about these particular things in the tile. <laughs> and, and if they were, if they were to, um, want a visual description of you, um, would you mind sharing? Uh, that? currently I, I've decided that I'm no longer uh, growing my hair out because every show that I, every play that I've ever done, every director asks me to grow my hair. Uh, and I don't want to do that no more. So I've started shaving it on purpose. Uh, I have a little bit of a chin strap beard uh, that I've gotten lazy with, uh, so it's a little bit more stubble. And I'm and I'm wearing a relaxing uh, Target gray workout shirt mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> Perfect, um, great. So so Michael Loker is my name. I was the scenic designer uh, for Spunk. It was my I think my first project. Mm -hmm. Cal, I have Cal Shakes, and I remember, I remember, I remember you calling me, John, and inviting me to do the project, and saying who was working on it. My, my, my dear friend uh, Patricia was was going to be doing this project, so made an easy, an easy yes. Um, I am, I am zooming in from 
from the unceded lands of the Akokisa people in the in the greater Houston area, which mm. which of course is is very close to the epicenter of the events that led to the Juneteenth Day of Commemoration. So, mm. um, you know, looking forward to actually spending the weekend seeking out some of the many the many uh, commemorative events and parties and celebrations around this region, around Houston and Galveston, that are all about uh, Juneteenth, where it all went down. Mm. Um, uh, I use he, him, his pronouns, um, and and if you if you you were looking at my my brand new office, uh, mm -hmm. I just moved from a from a house that didn't have an office to one that 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 did. The one that didn't have an office made a lot of sense um, when when I realized how close I'd be to my new workplace. And then the pandemic hit, and I needed an office, and and, and so I spent a year and a half working at the breakfast table with kids around. It was a disaster, but. Uh, <laughs> So we finally moved to a place where I have I have a, a some space and a built-in with some books back there and a, and a shutter that lets light in, and I'm wearing a I'm wearing a, a you know, Target Target has the best uh, pride wear and so this is my latest uh, my my latest my latest piece of pride wear from Target. Um, you know, those fit me and they they feel cool. Anyway, um, yeah, that's. That's what's going on. And I, I look from uh, the shoulders up, the same as I did back when Spunk was happening. But I look below, from here below, there's a little bit of a pandemic weight gain <laughs> happening, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> Trying to turn a new leaf. Um, with all you here, uh, you know, John, John had mentioned earlier a little bit, uh, and I really appreciated what you were sharing, John, about the sort of the... Um, just the, the the fact that this was the first this was the first black writer presented at this organization um, was it also the first all black company? Yeah, of uh, ensemble oh, yeah. of actors. Yeah. Um, can I ask then for you all just just to just kind of like to spread that out a little bit more? Sort of like what was it? What was the sense of that for those of you that were working on this project? You you shared a little bit about it, Patricia, but I'm curious you know, from, from some of you actors as well, like, was there, did you feel the responsibility? Was it something that you spent any time thinking about during the process or talking about, or was it like not a thing? I, I know worried about, I thought it was incredible. I knew the, I heard about the murmurings. I knew people, there was tension about it, but I was like, let's go. Like it was just, there was a maverick kind of thing that energy was going on. And we were like, we are here front and center and we were just doing our own thing. No matter, regardless of, it didn't even matter if it, for me, it didn't matter if we were the first, if people weren't used to it. I was like, here we are, we're in the building. <laughs> so I just thought it was incredible um, and I loved I always love uh, risk taking and that for me, that the whole experience and the, the way Patricia directed it and Paloma just choreographed it. It was so non -tradi It wasn't like when in school you, you do theater in a very traditional kind of regimented kind of way. This kind of blew the water out of all of that. And I was like, oh, we can do something new. So it was incredible. So, yeah, yeah was this gonna, was I, my, um, oh. No, go ahead, Margo. I'll go. I'll go. Uh, I, this was my first show at Cal Shakes. And Jonathan was always asking me, why don't you work at Cal Shakes? Why don't you come and do something at Cal Shakes? And I was like, oh, it's, it's too cold. I have arthritis, it's too cold. But <laughs> basically I wasn't interested in kind of what was being done. And so Jonathan was like, look, we're doing spunk. So what are you going to do? I said, oh, I'll do spunk. <laughs> and so I came in and it was, it was absolutely glorious because it was a time when there was an energy about the company, about the people coming together. There was an energy about Cal Shakes. Um, taking a risk and Jonathan saying, if you don't like it too bad. And we just went out there. I mean, the energy, I remember opening 
the power on that stage. We were just so excited to blow them away. People lost their minds. People were hollering, screaming. They were like, I've never seen anything like this before. What is happening? People were dancing on the stage on the weekends. It was just like this party, but the play just landed. The language landed. And then there was this whole scene about looking at the moon and the moon would come up. It was just like the perfect place to be. And, you know, I, I feel the same way when I think about it. It's, it's, an, it's emotional um, because, and I'll talk a little later about what happened after, which was another part of this beautiful journey and, and my journey with Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say that, like, it's it's one of those things that, like, especially after, you know, you're spending time because, like, I, this uh, this show happened in between my second and third year uh, in grad school. So I was still I was still at ACT at the time. Uh, and and uh, similar to my undergraduate experience, like there was <laughs> I think that during the time that I was undergrad, we did one show that had all black folks and everybody was upset because it was like we didn't get to audition for it and it was like yo but we couldn't be in any of the other plays um and and i and while i recognized the beauty of what was happening it didn't and maybe i just wasn't you know aware it didn't feel like a thing to me it just felt right it felt like it was what it was supposed to be um it felt like family from the very first Moment. I, I, won't, I don't even want to say from the very first rehearsal, I feel like that was one of the best audition experiences that I had, where I felt loved and supported and, 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 and that it was like, it was already family in the room going like, what you got, like, what you're going to bring, like, we're going to have a good time here, like, let's just play together and see what happens. Um, and, and I shared this with Eric in the email when he asked me about this, but like, I was... I was gonna quit, I was like done. I was gonna leave ACT. I was like, I don't wanna act no more. Like this is like, this is no longer fun. And I started the rehearsal process for this and like, and I met all of y'all and I like, I don't, I don't wanna say company. I do wanna say family. Uh, it felt like family from the very first day. Uh, and it's the, and it's the only reason I'm still an actor uh, because I'd gone through a bunch in grad school that year. I had lost a couple of family members and things like that. And I came into this group of people that just, there was never a moment where I was in that room where I didn't feel like from like, from the very first day of rehearsal to after the show closed, like even to today, <laughs> seeing all of your faces in this room, I never felt like I wasn't in a space of joy ever. Um, and that's a rare experience. Uh, so yeah, I just, yeah. I remember, um, Amose, what you say. The way Patricia directed the piece was a non canonical way of directing. It was, she would say to me, this part, just, it's going to be like this for a while, or I'm going to try, it's going to be like this but I'm pretty sure Paloma and I are gonna make it that, but we're not sure yet, but you're gonna see this. And as an artistic director, you're like, okay, <laughs> you know, you're like, I'm, I'm in. And indeed, it was, a, it was an extraordinarily reimagined for me process of directing. When I say canonical, I, you know, I, we talk about canonical work. I'm sorry, someone's running for office upstairs. Uh, people talk about canonical work. I, I think of canonical directing, that, that, you know, this is how you direct. This is what a good stage picture looks like. This is what, you know, you go down, you know, those kinds of things that have been kind of deemed rules. Trisha knows the rules. Trisha did not adhere to the rules until they revealed themselves to be true to her in the process. And that was a re that was a centering, a recentering 
that I've never forgotten. And I, I, I actually did forget until you brought it up on Mose and I am um, so grateful for that. And the second quick thing I'll say before I pass over is I do remember Margo kept saying, I've got arthritis. I said, I've got mittens. I've got this, I've got that. And she's like, Jonathan, I do not want to do a Shakespeare play outdoors with you. And I was like, okay, you could have just told me that because I figured out all the hand issues. But then, <laughs> but then we went to Spunk and she's like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> and then she stayed for Paulina, et cetera. That's right. Once you got her in, then it's like. That's right. Now, now what, because I think that's actually, it's hard for us to feel at home sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, and and this journey, I, I always say rigor and love. I try to infuse a lot of love into every process I do because I think it is also rigorous. There's a toll. This piece was so joyful, but there's also really hard things. There's generational trauma in it. It's not a lot, you know, it's the surprise. It's that George C. Wolf surprise. Um, but it's so much easier when you feel at home and you feel like you are also trusted. I saw sometimes John being like, I'm going to trust, you know, even if it's outside of like my comfort zone, I'm going to just continue to like actively lean into trusting. And that helped us all feel at home because I think sometimes we're, as black artists, I feel like sometimes we come in as show ponies and like, you better come in and do your trick and do your trick. Like, I think you're gonna do your trick and be a show pony for me. And I really, in grad school, some of my favorite people were scientists in grad school. I was very lucky to get to know some of the scientists and they would always talk about the laboratory. And they were like, you can't just do the same experiment. Another scientist did that experiment. You need to go do your experiment. And to me, I translated that as like, as much as I know some of these rules and I so appreciate the way I'm, both of you articulate the thing, part of me kind of um, rebelliously was like, I, I don't want to just be a trick pony. I rigorously want this to be exceptional. Like I want it to blow out the water for all of the reasons, theatrical reasons for the next black, you know, company for all of those kinds of things. But I also want to give ourselves the space and agency and take up that we're not just going to show up with our tricks, that we're going to claim home which is a place you can be your full self and allow for that it might fail. What is this one dimensional to two dimensional to three dimensional? What the hell is that? Who knows? We experimented and found out and that high risk and the ability to have a home that will, that will encourage you and even outside of comfort zones, encourage you to risk, I think is the place that then made it feel like a home and continue to feel like a home. And even though Margot might have said, I'm not coming to do there for Shakespeare, once you realize like, oh, it can be a home, then that's a place I can stay and I might not even need your gloves. There was so much trust, like, you know, from 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 day one and the, the way in which things were presented, even, the, even as we were trying something new that we didn't know, like we didn't really know what it was, like it just felt, it felt safe to try things. And that's the best kind of environment to be in where it's like, yo, we're doing something that we don't know how it's gonna turn out, but like go on this journey, like go on this journey with us and see what happens. And that, and that requires an incredible amount of, uh, amount of uh, giving from, from Patricia, from you and Paloma and from Jonathan as well. And, and you created an environment like, I mean, I remember like the check-ins, which I like, I still like every time I like run into like encounter you in another space, like it, it allowed everyone to be as they were in the space on the day that we were there and go like, all right, so this is where I'm at and we're going to do what we're going to do today. And that, that's a beautiful thing that I think is very rare. Uh, and I think goes along with what you were saying, because it, it requires an incredible amount of trust to be able to take those kinds of risks and make them turn into something successful because we go like, we don't know if it's going to work, but let's all dive in completely. Cause if we don't, it definitely won't work. Um, and I think we've created some beautiful stuff because of that. Tai or, or anybody, can you, can you talk, can you tell the folks who are, are listening in or going to watch this about the check-ins and I, I, I could do it, but 
every show I've ever done in my life, every class I've ever taught in my life since that time, I practiced that. But I'd love to hear what your experience was with it because it, it changed my way of working completely. Yeah, that's the, the I am, I want, I need, I feel. So like every day at, at the beginning of rehearsal, we did a little circle and everybody went around and you answered those and you answered those four questions uh, in whatever space. And like, and it was a thing, it was like, it was a completely acceptable for you to be honest. It's like, I am tired today. Like I, like, I feel like I don't have the energy for this rehearsal. Like if you came in and said that, like everything was acceptable because it, it allowed you to like speak your truth into the space. And once your truth is in the space, it allowed you to let, it, I feel like it allowed, it, it allows you to let it go and be present because you're no longer carrying it on your own you now have a community that's carrying it along with carrying it along with you because everybody knows like this is where he's at so like maybe you know uh, uh uh peter is feeling a little bit stressed out today so we're going to carry peter a little bit more or, or you know aldo had a, had a rough morning because of something that went on with uh, with his kid or whatever so like we're going to carry him a little bit more today that energy of like supporting each other was just beautiful um, and I've, I've also stolen the check-in and I use it. I, I've adapted a little bit for myself, but like I definitely stole it from, <laughs> from you, Patricia. And, and I have to say, I have to give original credit to Ira Steck, who was a, a fourth year student when I was in SMU. He's this like six foot four ways, you know, like Irish guy, looking guy who now teaches high school um, drama. And I wrote him a couple of years ago. And I said, Ira, I want you to know that when I was an assistant stage manager in my sophomore year, you, I don't know where you came up with it, but you did this exercise that I always thought about. And it took me, it always felt true, but it took me a while to be brave enough to do it. Cause I thought I needed to be like a tough intellectual director. And then I started doing it and it's changed my life and it's changed the lives of so many people. And I think what it does is we were, you know, I was just saying, we're, I'm working with Ron Seacrest Jones on this piece. And when we walked in today, he said, um, you know, our, our currency is our humanity, but we're often asked to go into places in very inhumane ways. And so I think it serves that purpose of being like, we're all humans, let's hold this together. And then now let's get to work. And so I just had to give a shout out to Ira. You know, I'm so happy when I hear that it ripples on to other people. And I want to give a shout out to the person who I originally got the, the ripple from. So shout out to Ira, for sure. And, and oh, hey, Aldo. Um, I, <laughs> so so I, I wanted to say that, you know, as a, as, as a person, an artist, first of all, who's new to this stage in this company, um, a, a non-white artist, but a non-black artist as well, um, and, and was very aware of the status of this show and the history of the company. Um, and, and I'll confess, you know, that, that was for me a source of a lot of anxiety, particularly early on, this, this sense of, of what the expectations and the responsibility of, of, of the project were, responsibility that the company had, that the cast and the team, and that people like myself, in particular a non-Black artist working on this show had. And, and so I have to say, I mean, what followed that that anxiety was was uh, a parade of senses of, of, of gratitude, really Gra gratitude that that uh, the project was led so well by by artistic leaders like Patricia and her sister, of course. Um, uh, gra gratitude that that uh, as everyone has has described her way of working and her approach to to receiving and processing this this language and this, and this and the expressions of the show, her way of working was received and supported by, by John and by the company so well. Um, gratitude that the cast had a great time with it and did wonderful, beautiful work and felt, felt appropriately uplifted by the responsibility and the experience of doing the first, the first black themed show and black cast show at Cal Shakes and nailing it. And then his gratitude that the show, that the show brought so much so much to the to the to the space and to the community that was such a big wonderful hit to watch any given night um and and those those experiences in in, in theater we, we encounter anxiety a lot <laughs> in, in the arts ob obviously we all we all do and and when when your great anxiety is met by by you know voluminous uh gratitude and, and 
and satisfaction. That's, uh, those are special ones. Those are the ones to hang on to. I often say that we'll, you know we are often we're chasing those dragons again and again in the theater. We're always we're trying to to recreate the, the experiences of those shows where they the play just lands, as Marlo said, and the, and the experience clicks. Um, and this was definitely one of those, uh, and and it was one of those for all the very best reasons. Aldo, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Aldo Billingsley. Uh, I use uh, he, they. I am on uh, Moekma Ohlone land, and uh, I am uh, sitting in front of a green screen, but the image on that green screen is uh, my kitchen uh, and uh, my wood-toned kitchen, and, uh, and, and the picture was taken when it was clean. Uh, um, uh, uh, and so, uh, yeah. Um, there is that, and it is so good <laughs> to see all y'all, um, you know, the, the, the sisters McGregor and all their power, um, Patricia, who Margot said uh, in, in our rehearsals during Spunk, one of my favorite statements that Margot's ever made was, we prayed, I prayed for you to come, and uh, uh, that touched my heart, is that somebody like her would show up in that space, and it happened and it was a beautiful thing and uh uh paloma who uh when she would tell us to get up on the wall and strike a pose and we would find those positions holy cow that was some work and then that work manifests itself on on stage in a beautiful beautiful way um and uh it, you know it's kind of that that way that paloma works where um I'm going to push you, but I got you. And, and she carries you that way. And, and actually, she literally did hold me up, pick me up off the ground and, and carried me that way. Uh, so and, and I'm going to say, um, you look so good, woman. I, I have to ask you, how about now? How, how about how, how about now? Because I think it's uh, time. It's okay. time. <laughs> I miss you, Aldo. It's good to see you, Ty, even when your camera is off. And Michael, uh, thank you for that. With the, the words you just said, that's great. And uh, good to see you again, uh, Jonathan Moscone, fellow board member, and uh, Mr. Tang, who brings us all together in Leanne. And of course, the incomparable Margot Hall. Uh, make sure you all get to see her on her show. Can I um, add about the, uh, the I am, I want, I feel, I need, um, I think it's pretty much this year. Uh, I, I'm starting to understand the importance of, of affirming. It, it, what that was, was affirming. And there's something about, as the actor, being able to come into the room and let people in, as opposed to, you know, you go into the room, you put your stuff down, you look at your lines, you go. There's something about people making space for you to just be a person, because that's what you go in with when you're going in to these characters, is, is you. And you're you're playing these roles, you're serving these characters, but it's there's something nice about someone saying, okay, you, you get to be, you get to define, you get to express who you are right now before we even begin, you know, it's, it's refreshing. It's, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm being heard, you know, and I have um, more space to, or more energy, more, more voice to give to the characters that we're about to put on this stage. You know, and it was consistent all the way through. So, yeah, I I love it. Just in life, it's I I do the I am's uh, <laughs> since um, doing those shows. Like how important it is to say I am, because somebody else will tell you who you are if you don't say who you are. You know, somebody will tell you how you feel, even though it's not who how you feel. So you have to be, especially as an actor to be able to say, this is who I am. This is what I want. I feel this right now and it be respected. So yeah, and even as a person, so yeah. I remember, I can't tell, I'm sorry, Paloma, were you gonna say something? Go ahead, John, and I'll, I'll follow up. I, I, it just picking up, I, I, I really, I, I feel like I'm not gonna attribute this correctly, but I do know it came from Patricia. 
And I felt like it was quoting Zora Neale Hurston, but maybe I'm wrong. But the closest thing to being loved is to be listened to. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if, if I'm attributing the words correctly, but I do know it came from Patricia. And that kind of ritual, that process, yes. being listened to, was being loved. Mm -hmm. And there's, so there's anger inside of love. There's protests inside of love. There's so many things inside of love. But when you're listened to, love does carry it through. Mm -hmm. And that was the gr deepest and most consistent example of that happening began with Patricia for me. Y'all, yeah. you know, y'all, y'all was... got me crying. You, really? The, the thing that I was going to say uh, um, was that I also feel like as someone who typically works in a more devised theatrical way, like contemporary dance is incredibly like collaborative in it in its creation process to work in a theatrical process what I appreciate about working with Patricia is that sure there's a script but the I am I want I need I feel feels like an entry point or a threshold by which uh the company the family can understand that who they are what they want what they need and how they feel are actually a part of the work. It's not just like, oh, this is a great way to feel good. It's like, no, we need you to access all of that because we're actually making this thing up together. There's a script, but we're actually co-creating uh, a, we are co-creating uh, this theatrical event together. And it requires that we access and be true about who we are, be able to hold one another through that because those kind of collaborative creative processes bring up all kinds of stuff. And so if you practice the grounding, it's a ritual, a ritual so that each day we can cross the threshold into this collaborative creative space with rigor and love, as Patricia says, with a great deal of understanding of the range of who we be on any given day and over the course of a, of a process together. And I think that also allows us to kind of continue to be in this uh, family relationship, whether we see one another or not over time, like we cross thresholds together and ritual helps to build that, but it also helps to build a work. Like the work got built off, off of I am, I want, I need, I feel as well. And I'll share that it's the, I'll share as much as John did as much as I did or tried to do and Paloma tried to do, it takes a company of people who trusts and goes with that because ultimately you are the embodiers of the experiment. You were the people who held and did the like technically very precise work of what it is to bring a language piece with the same kind of critical analysis that it takes to look at a language piece like Shakespeare, a language piece, you know, like Ibsen. Right now I'm analyzing Beckett. Zora Neale Hurston is like that. She cared about language like that. We had to investigate and have the appetite to investigate, clarify and serve that language while also mining in yourselves what it is to have unconditional joy and unattended sorrow. All of, I mean, the, the piece is deep, it's heavy, it's joyful, it's deep, all of those things. And you all came in with an appetite. So it makes it easy. It made it joyful and easy, not to say that it wasn't still rigorous, but it was such a joy to do the work because you go into some rooms and there's suspicion of joy. You go into some rooms and there's suspicion of an actual invitation for collaboration. And you all were titans. As a family, you know, we built this beautiful thing that I think still has resonance, but also your ability to bring yourselves, your talent and your trust and your appetite for the work. So whether that was Paloma saying, get your back up on the wall and y'all be like, all right, we gonna do it one more time. <laughs> Because something, or or finding like Aldo and Tai, what y'all just did with that that um, 
Zoot suit. Pas de deux. T pas de deux? <laughs> and we tried to bring, and you all brought, you know, I feel like Zora has brilliance. George C. Wolf had brilliance. And I feel like we didn't, we tried to bring all of ourselves and you guys had such an appetite to say, we are going to try to meet them and bring ourselves to it. And I, it was just so joyful with that. And it wasn't to say that we didn't question because I feel like it's important to be in a room where we're really asking questions. What does that mean? But the asking questions was with trust and love so that we were all investigators together with the same goal. And then we extended, you know, another thing that I think John and the whole organization said, you know, I said, I come from carnival. I come from parade. I want this to feel like a carnival. I want it to feel like a parade as well. So a uh, true born who was our musician who didn't come from the theater background, but come from a musical genius background that we were just like, let's figure out how to make this pre-show feel like a Pied Piper welcoming into a new day. And let's feel as often as possible to feel like there's a dance party and a parade out so that the thing that we all created that I felt like there was part of the success of it was it didn't just feel like us over here. It felt like in the Juneteenth celebration that was extended to the whole company and in the performance that was extended to the whole audience. So we weren't just saying we're here to occupy this space. We were saying we are here to create a new day. And, and that Patricia, that, that appetite comes from not having that type of work. So we were hungry. I know I was. I was hungry for a black play for words that's gonna trip off my tongue. I was hungry for a culture. Um, so when, when that dropped, of course, we came in like ravenous wolves at this material because we were so happy to be in a space together and working on something um, that was part of us. So that gift um, is why also, why we were so successful was because we've been waiting for it. Um, and it was just a joy that it came and yes. continued. Yes. When I think of um, Black Odyssey so many years later, um, which is truly one of the great pieces of theater I've ever seen, it, the, the, it, it reminded me, and being away from the, from the Bruns reminded me to have that scope, to have that scale, to have it outdoors, to have it epic, is a space is a, that is afforded to a monolithic cultures primarily. And to have that and to hear that Black Odyssey sing like that and just to, to remember it now with spunk, that it sang to the hills, that was political, that was epic, that was theatrical. And it was, I talk about hunger, I can't speak for your hunger, Margo, but it fed something to me that I didn't even know I was hungry for. We had to get um, to the get. We had to get to it. You had to get to the yeah. get. It's, yeah. But it's, to the get. it's also revolutionary in that on the stage where you do Shakespeare, and though Shakespeare brings in characters from other classes besides the aristocracy, the stories are focused on the aristocracy. And you take onto that same stage and you bring just folks and you take us into that life and you see that it's just as vibrant it's just as rich and it is just as valuable just as worthy and when once and and the audience is able to live vicariously through those characters and feel their joy and their pain uh so uh i i, I still remember the, the that you know Amaze and my character would get married and we have all this great joy and then and then Taiyi's you know, character is in bed with with Amaze and it's just that moment and hearing the audience just be crushed and they'd be like oh well it's one that they see it but when they see my character walk in and see it that's when you would hear them oh and they that's no one they feel that pain and then uh 
and then I would walk around and, and do, 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 do the walk of the depressed and I'd come back around and, and all the joyful um, uh, lipstick that, that Amazé on those beautiful lips were with, with this, this uh, right purple lipstick and it would get on my lips. And so uh, you know, the stage crew would be there with a, a, a little baby wipe for me to wipe the makeup off. And then I'd, I'd walk around again. And one day they forgot and they didn't use the baby wipe. They used like a Clorox bleach wipe. And I went like, oh. <clears throat> and so we, <laughs> we, we had a little panic. Uh, but as I came back on, you, you, I'd walk, you'd be walking by people and you'd hear them, oh, and they're, ju they're just hurting for those characters in the same way they had been with Lady M or King Lear in that same space before. I love I, it. I, to piggyback on that and to piggyback on what John said, you know, one of the great, one of the great revelations of good theater and of a piece like this, and, and he mentioned Black Odyssey as well, is, is that not only are you know, stories about just folks you know, worthy of being told, but, they, but they're capable of occupying the same monumental scale and, this, and they're, they're capable of singing to the hills in the same way that, 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 that the classics quote unquote do or that pieces about aristocracy do. And that's, that's such a wonderful revelation. And if you're not familiar with theater and you don't see a lot of theater, you don't often see that. You don't see a story about, about a working class guy who loses his wife to another man in his bed. And, 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 and you're not used to seeing that story fill the hillside um, like, like, like it can in a space like this if it's handled properly. And it's worthy of that kind of scale. It's worthy of that kind of projection. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, nope. I was going to say, and I love that the grace note at the end of the play, which is that amazingly through unbearable pain that we watch a man who we love bear, literally carry, and yet there is a grace where he finds a way and she finds a way and they find a way. And so it helps us all find a way, not to say that that would be the solution for everyone, but I thought it was really important that while we go into the wound, I think about black trauma a lot. And I think about black joy a lot. And I think about the reality of our lives, which often fluctuate between those two. And so that moment, it's part of the gift to me of what that production landing that was, was the way that you all were able to hold that and that we find that we don't end with tragedy. We don't end, there's, there's a wound, but we also show a way. And that to me made me feel like that's how you get to the get. You gotta go through it and then find the other side. And so it was, yeah, that, that, that to me was like a really important, just gift that Zora and George gives us, but the way you all held that help, will help people bear what sometimes feels unbearable and hopefully find a way to the other side. And how you found that, sorry, Tai. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, go ahead. It, well, earlier I was saying like, Patricia, you said, you said this phrase, uh, un unconditional joy and unattended sorrow. And the, and the ending becomes the, the, the sorrow is tended to. You know, we get, we get a moment of hope. We, that, that attention is given to that space that leaves us once again with the, with the potential for, 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 that, for that joy that we were talking about before. And I just like, I, I heard you say that earlier and I was like, ooh, ooh, God, that's so juicy. And I feel that's like juicy. it landed for me fully when you just said what you just said about the end of the show. So I just wanted to drop that, drop that little, little bit in there. I, you know, after a while, being an artistic director was excruciatingly hard, but there, was, there were moments of joy. And the joy for me was sitting and watching moments being figured out with delicacy and bravery. And I remember the end of the show. Oh my God. I love that. I, the, I remember the end of the show being figured out. Oh, we got to talk about the puppets. The, um, the, the end of the show being figured out so delicately and so bravely and with such care at 1130 at night after a preview and all of you holding it. And those are the moments when I sat in the back and I would just say, this is why you run a theater. 
This is why you watch. This is why you see this. Oh, look at that. Look at Dawn. And that, I feel like that's also collective. Like to me, my belief is that I don't have to have, I don't have to have all the, all the ideas. I don't want to have all the ideas. What I need to know is to be able to listen enough for the best idea and to create the space where we can collectively up until the very end. Oh, I forgot about that. Oh Lord. Tai, look at you, Tai. You getting in trouble all over left and right. Don't was that Laura? Is is that that was that Laura? That is Dr. Laura Hope. <laughs> Love it. Professor in Walla Walla. But that's what I mean. We all, John, your notes, the actors, ev the company, the designers, everyone held on until the very end. You know, we held and then we let it go. And, and, uh, and that's the party, Tracy, Tracy Barlow. Barlow. Yes. I mean, like, we would be remiss not to yes. name Tracy Barlow. Yes. Because Tracy Barlow. Holding it down. Holding it down. I love you know, also grounding in and as part of Paloma's practice. She said, I'm the choreographer, but there's certain parts of this choreography that are really important that somebody who is steeped in this tradition and also local. So like, how do we, how do we not just try to hold tight to everything? <laughs> how do we welcome in? How do we expand the circles and you know people coming up and being able to on those dance party nights man that was yeah important. to me it doesn't get better than that it was we did our thing and then we invited everyone in and i yeah. hope that that embrace is you know is, is continued how many i can't remember aldo had you done a show at cal shakes before no this was uh uh my first uh, and and Margot's first. Your first in at yeah. Cal Peter had done plenty of shows. Peter had, had yeah. done shows. Yeah, before, he, before Peter was in the company. Yeah, but it was uh, it was, and I always love when I see y'all doing things at Cal Shakes. I'm like, the Spunk family. Thanks for getting us in the door, Jonathan. Yeah. My friends, uh, this party is now getting big, and I gotta go. I love you all. I am. This is Eric. Your generosity in this moment. I, I can't thank you enough for including me. Patricia, I love and adore you. Amose, Marco, I'm here to serve you from now on. Aldo and work with you. Tai, don't grow your hair. Michael, it's great to see you. Paloma, keep doing it. See you all soon. Bye, Bye Jonathan. Bye, Jonathan. Uh, hey, y'all. Um, cause we are in the waning moments of this little window of time that we've carved out of our lives, um, to reconnect. I just, I'm going to just share just a, a, a last question that I'll ask you all to reflect on. And if you feel like sharing, um, a response to it, that'd be great, but don't feel like you have to, um, you know, I've been at Cal Shakes now about, about six seasons. This is like the 10th summer. This will be the 10th summer since this production. So it's about a decade. It's about a decade. Um, and you know, basically the entire time they've been at Cal Shakes, the 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 staff, the staff especially, right, see this production in this moment um, as the extraordinary milestone that you all have been describing tonight. Um, it really cracked the thing open, right? But it like as with most things, it cracked the thing open in a way that also like it was like it revealed all the potential and it also revealed all the shortcomings. Um, and I guess the question, the question that I just have for you all as we're sort of like to kind of bring us to a close here, you know, reflecting back 10 years now after the fact, you know, what, I mean, what do we take from it? How do we see this moment that we're all in right now? Um, what's the connection for you? Is there a connection for you? What's the, what do we take from it? What do we take forward with it? I think because of my experience with Jonathan and Cal Shakes, I have hope. Um, I think it takes time, but I remember when after Spunk, Jonathan call, asked Peter and I to come into his office and he said, I need you. I need your help. I have to do this. I have to do this work because I've never felt like this before in my life. And he was 
in tears and he was like, what do I do? Where do I go next? And I was like, you go to your staff, you go and you change everything. It can't just be on the stage. Yes, we can do Raisin in the Sun and we'll do it well, but you have to start from the top and go all the way. And he was like, I'm going to do it. And before now, we're all talking about equity and diversity. Jonathan did that after Spunk 10 seasons ago, as you say. He brought in one of the toughest uh, EDI trainers, Carmen, and came in for two years, I think. And I was hoping Jonathan would be here when I talked about this. But for two years, she worked with that staff. Now, I'm not saying that everything changed. I'm not saying that everything was perfect. But if I look at Cal Shakes now with you there, Eric, and with the folks that are there, I have some hope because I did see something happen that created change. Um, so I'll say that. And, and I feel like that change to me, the difference between giving someone a room and giving them a home is the world. I felt like what we were given and then what we were continued to give, you know, for several seasons was a yeah. home. And when people feel at home, they can do their best. And it's not to say again, we don't have to, it's not that we're showing up to be, to be show ponies, but we can actually be our best, most magnificent selves when you make your institution not just a house for a one-off, but a home. Yeah, that's I want to. That's what it felt like. I want to piggyback on that because I feel like that's one of the major, one of the major experiences that I feel like connects me to this to this show in particular and to my experiences at Cal Shakes over the next couple of years is that it didn't fe it did feel like home. It didn't feel like we were you know you that. Jonathan brought in a bunch of black actors for the black show for the season. And that's all that they were going to, they were going to do, you know, like, and I, and I, and I encountered that a lot in a lot of other theaters. And I feel like this was a space where I felt very welcome for a number of years. And I was new to the Bay area. So like, I didn't know the history of the theater before that, but like I came into the space and was like, this feels welcome. And, and it feels like, Jonathan, like Margaret was saying earlier, it's the, it's the thing, Jonathan was doing the thing that theaters are talking about doing now uh, in a, and I don't want to say in a performative way, because I don't think that every theater is doing it in a performative way, but this journey started years and years ago. Uh, and sure, we're not, I also don't want to say like, we're completely there yet, but I recognize that like, that was a starting place to make that work happen. And I think it it changed the it changed the dynamic of that of that company. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, the company has definitely evolved. It's a different company than it was. It's a and it will continue to grow and change. Um, and I, and I would just say, you know, two things that come to mind right away is one, gosh, you know, we saw something change, an institution change, and it's so gratifying that it was art, you know, that changed that changed it. It was our craft that that changed it. And it's a reminder of something that I, you know, I love to, to go back to, which is this, this, this piece of ammunition in these, in these stupid culture wars that we have to fight, where, you know, the, 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 the belief that, you know, equity and diversity and inclusion, they aren't just moral imperatives. They are, but they're not just moral imperatives. They make for better art. You know, they make for better work. And that's... You can always go back to that, you know, with your boards questioning what you're doing. It makes for better art and better work, people. It just does. And and projects like these and trajectories like these validate that. And I love that. It's, uh, uh, so what it, where it takes us is just what everybody's saying and uh, what Michael just said. Um, not only does it make for better art, it attracts better artists. And there are artists who won't come when it's not being done. There are artists who, when they see it's just performative, will have to will will take the pass. Um, uh, the beautiful thing about that moment of uh, 
uh, of Jonathan in his office with Margot and Peter saying, help me. That's huge anyway for anybody, quite honestly, in America with testosterone to say, help me. We can't even ask for directions. So somebody saying, help me, that that says something. Um, and to continue through the wormhole when it gets difficult. It's getting, di- I mean, we, can, we got states that are, are, are playing an infantile game of no critical race theory because it's too difficult. It makes me feel bad. I'd rather sit under the table, cover my eyes and pretend you can't see me. And w- w- this, I mean, we are at that pathetic point because the wormhole is hard and trying to go through it is hard. And it doesn't mean it all gets better because it ain't perfect. But again, uh, you know, I, I, that theater, we got to watch that change happen. And part of it happened because somebody, Jonathan, had the courage to say, this is a play that we can do that still fulfills our mission. It's still a play about language. It's still a, a play about telling beautiful stories. It's just stories we haven't told before. Let's take a risk. I I want to add to that. Um, this is reminding me of a, I had a professor in school and he talked about his journey into becoming a tenure professor as an African-American man from the hood. And he was like, he had to wait to wear cornrows to class, to teach his students. And I want to normalize us not having to wait. I get tired of waiting. Like it all, I I just wanna just tell people, black people, we are not a last resort, you know? And I, there was something to that. And and I hearing the conversation uh, you all had with uh, uh, Jonathan Moscone, he was doing the work years ahead, like, and I and I hope uh, Cal Shakes keeps that tradition. Think ten years ahead before anybody, because a lot of people want to stay with that traditional model. And I just want to encourage Cal Shakes and other theaters to think ahead, go for it. That's the risk, you know, and then act upon it, you know. So yeah. That's all I got. For them to take as much of a risk with their theaters as mm-hmm. they want us to take on stage when we're acting. Exactly. Don't wait. So, yeah. Y'all, thank you for this. <laughs> thank, thank you for hosting it. Thank yeah, you for yeah, hosting it. Thank you. For continuing the work, man. Thank and, you. And just that it. one, one, th- one more thing, because Ty, you talked about home. Uh, George Floyd goes down and the invitation to come and gather and speak with other black actors who worked in the same theater, other black actors, not who were just in the same show, but who had been in the same theater over a number of shows, that invitation came from only one theater. Only one theater said, I want to give you a space just to talk with other people. And then I'm, I'm, I'm willing to step away. Eric, you were the only one, the only one. I, bl- I thank you for that and may God bless you for that. Uh, thanks, Aldo. I mean, uh, thanks. I came into the conversation late, late and I, I, I miss, I want to say that I'm on Powhatan land in terms of uh, the native people that are, that, that occupy the space that I'm currently in. Cause then other people said it and I was like, oh, I didn't do that right. So I just need okay. to correct. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Cal shakes you, everyone, you can show up late and still be on time. Mm. Mm-hmm. Ooh. So Eric, are we gonna That's do like, are we, are we gonna do this every year? When are we gonna do it every year? <laughs> yeah. When are we doing it in person? I'm just saying I'm just this is a, a thought and idea. I, well, are we just gonna do spunk again? Well so there's that. There is that. 
Um, I mean, they do We're Shakespeare every show. six. They do the same Shakespeare every six years. Why not? Word, right. word. <laughs> Union show. They, they, they roll right through. How many times are we gonna do? We gonna do Midsummer at this theater? <laughs> so, uh, and they don't complain. Um, <laughs> so again, see y'all next year. All right then. <laughs> y'all happy Juneteenth, everyone. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. Juneteen. Bye. Do we just leave now? Yeah. Okay. It's perfect. <laughs> I love, love you, Margo. Bye. I love you too, Eric. We should talk soon. Okay. Okay. We All will. Right. Bye.